Everyone, good evening. This is the what, August <laughs> August meeting of the Inventors Association, and hopefully you're all here because you're inventors, a startup, or somebody looking for information about how to move a project forward. Uh, we're all about empowerment and education for inventors, startups, and entrepreneurs of all kinds. So uh, we have um, always a monthly meeting. How many people are new tonight? So. Just to give you a sense, um, the meeting is always a wonderful speaker, uh, such as Ellen Volpe, who we have tonight. And sometimes we'll have what's called pitching panel, which is an opportunity uh, for an inventor to present their idea for the purpose of education and empowerment. And it's all about helping people move things forward. So if you are interested in participating in that in one of our next monthly meetings, uh, sign up where we show the meetup for pitching panel. Uh, the association is supported through its members. Uh, your door fee pays for the videographer. And also we have professional members who bring a valuable perspective to the members. Gordon, I think uh, you'd okay. like to stand up and say a little something to everyone? Hi, my name is Gordon Randall Perry. I'm an industrial designer and I work with inventors, startups, and I work basically from the beginning of your idea, if you want, if it's something just in your head or on a piece of paper and help bring it through to the finish so it's ready for production could even help uh, recommend places to get it made so I'm right here in New York City Greenwich Village I encourage you to give me a call I'd be happy to work with you thank you do you have a card? sure and Louis Del Judas who is our host also here at Troutman Sanders thank enabling you. us to have this wonderful space Louis good evening uh, I am a patent attorney Soft IP as well, to copyright trademarks on mm -hmm. yards. Lewis, can you um, speak up a touch, please? Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> patent attorney, I usually speak too loud, that's why. Um, partner here at Troutman Sanders, we're always happy to have the Inventor Society here. Um, anytime you need some help, feel free. Come see me, I'll give you a card, give me a call. We can talk about things. I realize you know, where I am in the market. And I may not be perfect for everyone, but at least I can drive in the right direction. We have other professionals here in the room that do what I do as well. So there's a nice balance of opinions and, and sort of price ranges also for the skill sets. So you're welcome to give me a buzz and we can get you in the right direction. Great. Thank you very much, Lewis. Uh, we have a couple of other professional members who are not here tonight. And also, are, uh, in case you're wondering, our monthly meetings usually have a few more people attending. Uh, but I think because of August, not because of the quality of the speaker this evening, but I think it's a great opportunity because uh, what Ellen's going to talk about will be interactive and give everyone a chance to participate. So, um, but why I asked Ellen to speak, and this is, uh, I think, important. Some of you may have heard me talk about the five fatal flaws of inventorship, and it revolves around the fact that people don't tend to plan. They have kind of a uh, misunderstood uh, understanding or sense of value of IP. It's important sometimes, sometimes not as important. They don't predict what they want to do uh, or validate early on. They're not aware of their numbers. And the fifth, which I find is a flaw, is that people don't understand the people around them. And that's also commonly known as networking. And Ellen is an expert in networking. She's been operating an organization for 25 plus years uh, called ABA, American Business Associates and has brought together people in various industries um, throughout New York, uh, 13 chapters, and basically to help people understand how to build networks of valuable resources. And as an inventor, one of the things we have a shortage of sometimes is both time and money, and a way to leverage those is through the use of valuable human assets. So um, I think Ellen's gonna open our eyes to some interesting opportunities with that. So Bruce, yeah. do people know you? Uh, and I'm Bruce Seltzer, excuse me, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, and nice to meet you. <laughs> I am the president of the association, and um, I also operate a business called MCI Products Group, and we assist companies make sure all their good ideas turn into good businesses through planning, patenting, prototyping, and production. Thank Hi, you for everybody. the reminder. So, um, you know, whenever I'm with a group of people, I almost can't help myself. 
Um, I'm so curious about what people do and who they are. And I think since we are a small group, I think we have an opportunity um, tonight to be a little bit more specific and perhaps um, I'll be able to leave you with um, maybe a new inspired way a new inspired way of um, going out into the world to quote unquote network. Um, so I think before I start, what I'd like to do is very quickly go around the room. I'd like to know your name um, and the focus that you have today. Please be brief. So I'll let you start. Yeah, James uh, D. If, Mitchell. If you could speak a little bit yeah. louder so everybody James can hear. James D. Mitchell. Uh, I have a, uh, a pending patent on a uh, sports device and um, just having a hard time with my uh, examiner. Um, he's knocked down a few of my claims, and I've uh, resubmitted, and so I kind of need some help. Okay, great. I'm Rob Fromm. I'm a dentist <laughs> by trade, nice. entrepreneur on the side. Uh, I've taken one of my products that I invented with my 12-year-old daughter to prototype, and now what do we do with that? And I have another product in the works. So, now, what do we do? Excellent. May I ask the rest of you when it's time for you to speak to stand in, because I think you'll project easier, be easier for other people to hear. May I ask you? Yes. Stand? Uh, my name is Alfred. I'm a civil engineer. I'm here also having the same problems as he is. I'm trying to patent something, so it's in the patent process, but I need some help. Okay, good. Uh, Dave Laporta, I'm a product designer. I'm here to learn more about the networking aspect of All right. business. I hope I can can do that for you. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm a couple I'm an inventor. I have a couple of things uh, pending for patents. Excellent. Okay. Would you like to go? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Steve. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm here to uh, hear about your uh, networking questions. All right, great. Oh, uh, <coughs> My name is Francis, and uh, I just tagged along with him. All right. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm not going to let you get away with that. You do something. What do you do? Uh, actually, I'm a software engineer, and I work in the financial sector, and we've been working on some projects for the last couple of months. Excellent. So, Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Bill Samuels. I'm an IP attorney. I have a small intellectual property boutique shop, and I also have a side venture with a client, and we're hopefully going to be able to get a patent. Okay, great. Hello. My name is Joy Morales, and I'm an inventor. My uh, focus is children's consumer goods. I have uh, one invention that I brought to prototype, and I'm working on a business plan, and I'm looking for trusted ethical professionals that can help me on my next steps in my journey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Morning. You have to forgive me because I, that's all I do is morning meetings. It's <laughs> like I feel like I'm on another planet. Yes. Uh, my name is Patrick Raymond. Uh, I'm an inventor myself. Um, I work. In, I run a small creative marketing agency, and on the side, I'm commercializing uh, an invention that Lewis and, and Bruce and Gordon have helped me put together. So they're really great guys. Excellent. <clears throat> Hi. My name is Marta. I'm not an inventor. Just here to listen and observe. <laughs> My name is uh, Greg Guinan, and um, I'm an inventor. I have an engineering background, and I'm looking to maybe collaborate with other people as well as, well as kind of um, network and expand that. Uh, my name is Tom. I own a Pilates studio, and I've been a closet and inventor, so I've been coming to the meetings to <laughs> try to figure out which ideas might be worth pursuing. Okay, good. Everybody should go to take Pilates and then they'll get more creative. Absolutely. Mind and body. <laughs> I'm Sherry Brown. I'm trying to bring software to market for data warehousing and start the provisional patent process soon. Um, so I'm here to learn about networking All right. and any other knowledge I can soak up. Okay, excellent. I do want to overlook Brooke and Margie. Margie. I was going to say Marta, but Marta's over there. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah. Yes. Okay, secret's out. Brooke right. is my daughter. Right. <laughs> Margie is a very nice, long family friend. A good, a good dear friend. So, um, 
sort of, let's say, with a show of hands, who thinks that your networking is between 75 and 80 percent of where you want it to be? Anybody consider themselves really good at it? You do. I, I don't know about good at it, yeah. but you do it all the time. Great, great. Um, so maybe I can teach you one or two things, but for the rest of you, you know, one of the things that I want you to recognize that most people overlook is that you have assets in your database today. Those are people that you've met that really can be gateways to opportunities that you might not even be able to see at the moment. Behind every person that's in this room is a crowd of shadows. Uh, we don't know who you know. We don't know what you've done before. We don't know to what extent your influence is hard at work for other people. And the name of the game for networking today is really to network for advocates. Those are people who will introduce you because they know you, they trust you, they understand what you're doing, and they are willing to help you. That doesn't happen just by coming to an event and exchanging a business card. It's something that you have to work at um, that will pay you dividends. These assets that you have in your database are really basically asleep. The only way that you can wake them up is to manage those relationships in one of two ways. One way is to be in touch with these people on a consistent basis, to let them know what you're doing, who you're doing it with, and to take that to the next level, to find out what other people are doing, to see where you may be able to make appropriate connections. I'm constantly amazed at how many people don't understand that what we have going right here in this room is a honeycomb. And I want you to see it because what I notice lately, can I ask you to take one of the chances that? What I notice lately is that the most simple concepts around networking are sometimes the most misunderstood. It's very difficult for people to see the connection when it's not obvious. Um, I have a friend that says all the time, what's obvious in hindsight is never in foresight. And when I heard that, I thought to myself, that is so true about networking, because most people, their idea of networking really is very transactional. It's like, if you can't help me, then I'm going to move on to the next person. <coughs> and when you do that type of networking, it's very it's not effective. It feels negative. It doesn't inspire you to go out and do more of it because it doesn't lead anywhere. Now, I'm not saying that the universe isn't going to randomly put you in touch with somebody that you need. If you need a dentist, he's in the room. But for the most part, when you're looking to build your business, what you're looking for, aside from the, the advocates, and I heard somebody say it before, are the appropriate resources. And I think that networking today is about those resources. We don't have time or money to waste on bad decisions, on not being in front of the right person that can help us with exactly what we need. That's very doable if you have a network that's working for you. You know, I have a network that I built over 26 years. Basically speaking, I can put out an email, not on my LinkedIn and not, uh, you know, over Facebook, but I can actually be in touch with the people that know me, that like me, that trust me, and I basically can ask for anything. So yesterday I got a phone call from somebody that is not in one of my network groups, but who I know, and he said to me, he's in the security business, he said to me, I'm working with a very, very high-end client, and I need, um, a, um, I need a forensic accountant. And I thought to myself, well, I know a couple, but I actually know somebody that knows the best in that breed. And what I did was, I said to that person, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wait, unless you need this person tomorrow, I'm going to do my research, and I'm going to come back to you with who it is you really need to be speaking with. That influence 
And just that act of doing that is building my social capital. And social capital today is sometimes more important than the capital you have in your bank account. Because the money that you have in your bank account can pretty much buy what you need. But it won't prevent you from making bad decisions, buying things for your business that you don't need. So all of that social capital is based on building relationship and not being transactional in nature. I uh, actually have written down a few things because um, because sometimes I forget. No. <laughs> um, but I want you to um, I want you to understand that we spoke about when I spoke with Bruce. We spoke about the value of influence, and we spoke about what having that influence is actually worth to you. I heard a few people in your introductions say that you really you you need these resources. You don't really know at the next juncture what step to take and who you can trust. Um, I can tell you, based on my experience with a person like Bruce, who really, except for uh, Brooke, is the only person that I know in the room, that um, Bruce is one of those assets, one of those people that knows people. And I want you to understand that based on the diagram that I just handed you, that, that the networking begins with you and two other people that don't know each other. And um, so the notes that I brought you, there's a guy, a professor at the University of Michigan um, who wrote a book called Achieving Success Through Social Capital. And um, his uh, tagline is a scientific approach of how things really are. Um, he is of, um, of the, um, uh, the opinion that there is a myth that we should be working independently that the, the, the culture is based on our independence. But in fact, it is about our inter interdependency. It's about how it is we can leverage, somebody used that word this morning, looking to do things with other people. That collaboration for your opportunities, your the things that you're working on, is one of your strongest, what can I call it? It's your ace in the hole. Because once you look to collaborate, there are people that want to know what you're working on today. <clears throat> there are people that will see what you're working on today as opportunity. Um, you're not meant to do this really by yourself. You're meant to do it through other people and who those people know that can connect you to and so that you can collaborate. Um, that's one of the strongest opportunities that you have, in particular in this room. You know, every person here might not have a business card. How many people have a business card? Okay, good. So some people don't. And I would encourage you, if you don't, to get one. Because your opportunity here is about making a connection and sitting down with people and learning about what they're doing in relation to what you're doing. Listen, it could be totally unrelated. But even if it's unrelated, because of the network that we can't see behind you, those are the people that you have been in contact with, that you've worked with, that you are related to, um, that, um, that, that you've done work for. You know, the network is just, it's so deep and so wide that, again, we can't see it. But I can guarantee you that when you meet with each other, just for coffee, what you're going to discover are things that you don't expect. They're, they're just, they're things that will come out that will line up the way they should because you've been doing the work that you've been doing. So, um, listen, the, 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 fa the fact that success is an individual matter, according to Wayne Baker, is a myth. Um, he says here, that myth gets in our way of understanding how the world really works. In doing so, it lowers our chances of success. It depresses our pay, it limits our promotions, it decreases the value that we create. It reduces our ability to get things done. It even jeopardizes our health and our happiness and our welfare. Because our mind is not open to the fact that I might be able to help you and you might be able to help me. We're actually in a comfort zone that doesn't allow us to step out and just be curious. And that's what networking is about. It is about stepping out and being curious about what other people are doing. 
we are interdependent. Um, the um, getting a job done is the best known uses of a network. So every one of you has something that you need to accomplish. You are not going to do it on your own. You're going to do it through the good works of somebody like Bruce or somebody that's sitting next to you that knows somebody else. This is the key though, we're not mind readers. We can't, you're not walking around with a sign that says this is what I need. As a matter of fact, in your introduction, some of you said so little that it's impossible even in that little period of time to even get a glimmer of what you're working on. That's a missed opportunity when you have an opportunity to introduce yourself because it's one word that you speak that somebody latches onto that says, aha, you can talk to this person because I'm getting an instinct and I'm gonna go with that instinct because I see a relationship. It's about having the courage to do that. It's about taking a chance. It's about being interested. I tell the story all the time. It's ironic that I just got an email from this person. Has anybody heard of Jay Abraham in this room? So Jay Abraham is a very, is a, he's, he's a world-renowned consultant. He probably gets twenty or $50,000, no kidding, an hour. Um, he's one of the first people that I ever studied. So Jay Abraham tells the story about going to um, Australia to do a presentation. He gets on the plane, it's a long ride. Anybody ever been to Australia? It's a long ride, right? He gets to Australia and the first thing he does is go to a bar, because that's what you do, I guess, after you travel that far. Um, I used to sleep there. Used to sleep. <laughs> well, he's at the bar, he sits down, he sits down next to somebody, and he introduces himself, and he asks the person, what do you do? And the man, talking, 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 and Jay's having his drink, and all of a sudden he's like, okay, it's time for me to go to bed. He looks at the man, he says, it's been a pleasure to meet you, you know, thanks for spending the time with me, and the guy says, well, wait a minute, I just, uh, I just want to tell you something. He said, you are by far the most interesting person I've ne ever met. And Jay, the moral of the story is Jay said nothing. He asked him a question. And Jay's tagline for that little story is, it's a lot easier and more fun to be interested in other people than trying to be interested. It's not about us when we're meeting. It's not, it's not about me. I'm curious. I want to give you my time, my attention, my listening, and perhaps my opportunity because of the fact that maybe I know somebody that can help you. I want you to know that you can be in totally unrelated business and still be able to have a conversation like that and be able to connect people. And if you can't connect them, it doesn't matter. What you're doing is building value and creating an asset in another person that's going to remember you because you're taking an interest in them. Um, <clears throat> Zig Ziglar, I like this. I always talk about Zig Ziglar. Help as many people get what you want in life. And uh, help, I'm sorry, that wasn't, that didn't come out right. Help as many people get what they want and you will get what you want. It's really, again, about taking interest in other people. I want to share some sound bites with you about networking since I think that, um, uh, you know, again, it's in my heart, it's in my blood. I, I should have started by telling you that in 1923 in Lower Manhattan, my grandmother had a network, and I have her business directory, and I have the times that they met, and I have, I didn't find this out until my grandmother had passed, and my father never told me, I don't think he knew. So it's in my DNA, and I guess I have the right to, to speak about it. Um, these are truisms about networking um, that you need to take with you tonight. Networking is not selling. Networking is looking for people who will advocate for you, who understand what you do, and will be great referral sources for you. Networking is a skill. If you don't feel really good at this, guess what? It's a muscle. Not everybody feels good about networking. Some people do not like to do it. They don't feel comfortable doing it. But I can tell you that if you do it correctly, it will be enjoyable, 
it will be productive, and it's a muscle. You can actually go to do Pilates and practice your networking muscle. Uh, <clears throat> and it will produce everything that you need. Uh, this is something that I want to tell you. My oldest group that I facilitate is 26 years old. And half of the people in the group have been networking for over 10 years. And some of them for the 26 years that they have been with me. Now you would say, how could we possibly have more to talk about after all these years? What could we possibly get from each other? But you have to understand how the world is operating today and how fast things are going. It's really important to recognize that every day of the week things change. People change, their focus changes, who they've met changes. All I know <coughs> is that I have a group of people who are totally committed to being advocates for each other. They're actually more like friends and relatives at this point than they are about business associates. But because that familiarity is there, they have advocates for life. They have opportunities that come to them all the time through each other. <clears throat> and one of the things that I want you to know is networking is being prepared to ask for what you need. So one of the things that is important as you move away from this meeting out into the world of networking is to understand what you're looking for and to be able to articulate it in a way that is short and sweet. The last thing you want to do is get up and drone on about what you do and how you do it and why you do it. You need to figure out the words um, and I'm sure that there are marketing aspects to what it is is being done here that can help you. But you need to figure out what to say in the shortest, most impactful way because you've all met the people. You are sorry once you ask them what they do. <laughs> because you can't back away. It's like you can't get away fast enough. You don't want to be one of those people but you want to have an appropriate response for what you do and how you help people, or what you do and what you're looking to create here with your idea. It's, I'm, I'm sure that, um, that the, the um, opportunity to pitch takes you through what to say, how to say it, get it done. That's a great point because um, we know, we see a lot, that if you ask a person to describe their invention, I will hear them talk about for five minutes what went on for the past 10 years and why this didn't work and who screwed them over and what opportunity instead right. of this is what my product does, this is how it helps people and stop talking. Right. Instead of droning on. You know, it's, uh, it's very, very important um, because what happens, by the way, when you are going on and on and on and on, you've basically lost the opportunity because the person has labeled you a yacker labeled you somebody that is not together, doesn't have the words and the impact that are really necessary. We live in a world of sound bites and you have to you have to find your own sound bites that are about your business, about your idea, and about who would be interested in them. Um, being prepared uh, to do that is really, um, I forget who said it, opportunity and preparedness. It's all at the same time. But you have to do the homework. You have to be thoughtful about that. Um, so, uh, some of you know Harvey McKay, he wrote many, 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 many books. If you don't, he's a good guy to read. He built an $85 million co uh, company on um, 3,000 names in his database because he took an interest in those people. I, ha I think he had, um, I don't quote me on this, but he had like a list of 100 um, questions that um, he made sure that every one of his salespeople asked every particular customer that they had. And they were all about them personally, about their lives, about them. And he developed incredible rapport with people that allowed him to build this $85 million company. So this networking that I'm talking to you about is long-term and it's cumulative. You can't get sick of it if you're if you are curious about other people, you shouldn't get sick of it. You should be selective with who it is you're doing it with, but you should be doing it on a consistent basis. It is going to help you get your needs met. If you don't do it, what happens is you're here, 
and your energy is vibrating down here because you're not engaged and nobody and nothing can reach you. You've got to build it up. You have to go out and you have to feel positive and you have to be, you know, congratulate yourselves for, com for coming here. This is very important for you. This is bringing you into the energy that you need to attract. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, I want to go back to is the diagram. Uh, because these entrepreneurial opportunities arise when a network contains these structural holes. That is, if you look at the diagram, and let's just, you know, pick, pick one of them. Your name might not be there, but pick one. And then recognize that between you and another person, there is a gap. And if you take the responsibility when you meet with a person, and, and again, totally unrelated business, and you go, oh, wow, I, that's very interesting what you're doing. I have a friend, Joe, I think that you should meet them, him. What happens is you immediately become part of that activity. You're bringing two people together that didn't know each other before, and you're raising your level of influence with those people. What that does, because people study this, is it creates um, that reciprocity gene. It comes out. Now, whether or not you're going to get help from either of those people, I have no idea. Maybe not. But I do know that the universe, God, whatever you want to say, your energy is out there. And it is going to start to spin around and create other, other incoming energy. That's just the way it works. It's just, it's science, and there are plenty of people that are studying network science now that are proving this to be true. If you're not out, it can't help, uh, it can't happen. Um, so you create value by bridging, bridging the structural hole. Both people will be inclined to reciprocate at some point in the future by providing information, ideas, context that may lead to business. You have to understand networking today, again, it, this is not transactional. We're not talking about your next sale. Because the truth be known, the most opportunities that are going to come to you are going to become be coming from other people who refer business to you. And, you know, the idea today is to make as much of that referral business come to you. And I, I'm, I'm using the word business lightly because I know in this room there are people that need resources in order to get their business to the next level. And whether or not it's direct business or it's the next person that you need in the piece of your puzzle to get your idea, your dream um, um, uh, realized, it can be people, it can be things, it can be information, it can be an article. You know, I ask people all the time, do you have time to read anymore? Are you reading anything except sound bites? It's really difficult when I see something on the BBC News that I think that would be appropriate for Bruce, I'm sending him a link because I'm sure that sometimes he's not watching. But we both like to watch that. And that happens all the time. If you read something that you feel is appropriate in somebody else's world and you send that out, you're continuing to build your influence with those people. Those are ways of reciprocating that don't have to do with direct business. I want to go over the distinction between a referral and a referral source. Because this too is something that is completely misunderstood. When you're networking, you are not selling and you are looking for two things. Direct referral for somebody that needs your service or other people that will be great referral sources for you. Now, the great one that everybody likes to raise their hands um, for are accountants. Who wants to network with accountants? Who thinks that an accountant can help you? Does anybody in the room think? Can I see higher hands? You think accountants? So, the interesting thing, are there any accountants in the room? I know that I'm being videotaped, so I'll try and be careful about this. <laughs> uh, but not everybody is a, is a risk taker. Not every accountant or attorney or influential person likes to take a risk. The only way they're going to take a risk is if they know you and you've closed a trust gap and they're willing to be your advocate. This doesn't happen overnight. 
It happens with time and effort. Uh, accountants can be great referral sources if you find the right one. They're not all great. Um, referrals mostly seen as transactions, again, linear, going directly to a deal. It's rare, I have to tell you. You know, again, I got the phone call from the security person. He's looking for, um, for uh, the accountant. Um, I'm going to give him the accountant. There's no guarantee he's going to get the business, but he's looking for a referral source. He's not going to hire this person himself. It's important to know that, um, and this is a fact. It's easier to give or fill the structural hole linking two people who are themselves not directly connected. An introduction to a referral source has more long-term potential for business and strategic partnerships. I will take an introduction to a referral source any day of the week, all day long, before I, sh I would take somebody just for direct business, because it's really a one-off. And maybe the lifetime value of my client is five to seven years, and it's, it's going to be a great referral. But I'd rather have a strategic partnership or a uh, understanding with somebody that can refer me business. You know why they can refer me business? Because we're fishing in the same pond. We might be in different businesses. Like, for instance, I'll use um, sales training. So people in the sales training business are good for me because every person that they're training should be networking, and if they're not, they're pretty much operating independently by themselves. Those people are great referral sources for me. Bruce can introduce me to somebody that will be a great member in my organization. I'm not saying that I don't want that, but I do want to be introduced to people that have the same affinity that I do, that are, that are selling some product or service to the same demographic group that I need to reach. They could be in totally unrelated business. Sales and networking is pretty similar. But for instance, I might say, uh, let's see, I have to think a little bit. Um, I might say, uh, well, I could say an accountant. But I haven't met too many accountants that want to open up their database because they, they don't take that many risks. I could say bankers. They don't want to take risks. I'd rather be with Bruce because he's a risk taker. I'd rather know other people that are risk takers and that are out meeting other people and, and hang around him, hang around them. Because that's what you're doing. You have to leave understanding that you have a network around you right now that's not active. Or if it is active, it can be more active. But it has to do with what you will put into it. You know, Ellen, I think what's really interesting. Um, by the way, is everyone finding this useful? Uh, I know Ellen for a long time, and every time I hear her speak, it just reinforces a lot. But that a lot of people are afraid of networking because they are afraid that it has to do with always asking people for something, mm -hmm. or that they're trying to sell somebody right. something. But it's going back to that taking the active interest and being a resource. It takes the pressure off. It takes, exactly. It takes the pressure off. And that's when um, the magic happens. Right. It takes the pressure off you looking for something. When you take that active role in being interested in another person, um, you will get your turn. And you need to be prepared for that turn. You need to know what you are looking for so that when that person says, how can I help you, you're ready to say, I need a new IP attorney or I need a design or I need money, or I need, I don't know what you need. Maybe you don't know what you need. But I swear, if you do the homework, if you prepare yourself, and you look in your own database, and you start engaging it, what will happen is something that you are not expecting. See, one of the things that, that is, is um, very common are these, these sort of cultural myths. Networking doesn't work. I've already done it. I, I never got anything out of it. You know, it's, it's, it's a, basically a narrow view of what's possible in the world today. Because it does work if you engage it. It's not easy if you are not used to it. But if you, as Bruce was saying, if you take the pressure off yourself 
and you start becoming really interested in what other people are doing and you are prepared, you will get your needs met. You will find the resources that you need. And even if you don't know them, this is sort of my little secret, um, they will come to you because what you focus on expands. Because what you are concentrating on, you begin to see. See, when you're concentrating down here, but your belief is down here, it's like, eh, I'm not really sure if it's going to work. I don't feel like going out tonight. Um, I'm not going to get up for that meeting. You know, showing up is half the battle. And when you show up, what happens is you're raising your vibrational energy. Sorry for those of you who are not on, on from that, that side of the world, but I know myself, if I don't feel like going, I shouldn't go. Because what happens is I'm gonna sit in a chair and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home after the event and I'm gonna feel like, why did I go there? So another little piece of advice, if you don't feel like going, don't go. Because you can't feel like going all the time. We don't always feel our energy is at a level that makes us want to, you know, be social. If you don't feel like being social, don't go. You don't have to go. But when you make a commitment to do it, go, go up here. Because what happens is your eyes start to see things at this level that they weren't seeing down here. You know, if down here you're feeling down or discouraged or, you know, um, I don't want to use the word hopeless, but if, if, you're, if you've been struggling and it's not coming and you wish it was here, it is here. It's out there vibrating. It is coming. But you have to get up so it sees where you are and so that you can prepare yourself for when that happens. Now, I have a secret about Jay Abraham, which I think is just the epitome of that. Um, because about a week and a half ago, you have to understand, I've studied Jay Abraham since I started my business because he was a master of marketing. There are lots of people that are great marketeers, but he resonated with me. I just thought that he was good. And um, about probably, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, I took one of his seminars on joint ventures and strategic partnering because it's something that I really like to do. <clears throat> you know, he's one of those guys that you can't reach. He's just out there. He's like an icon. I took the workshop. I bought the book. I got the t-shirt. I did the whole thing. But Jay Abraham is like, I'm telling you about him. I've been telling people about him for 26 years. I get an email two weeks ago from Jay Abraham. Now, I'm on his list, so you can say, okay, she got one of his emails. Well, I did, but the email said, I have a family member who is in New York. Um, is anybody out there, if you're listening, would you be willing to meet with my family member? Sure. The email went out. I get an email back um, that basically says, J. Abraham will be in touch with you. I get an email the day before yesterday from J. Abraham himself, from his secretary. He forwarded it to me personally written to me, saying, thank you so much for being open to meeting my son. I said, oh. You know, I never would have dreamed that I'm going to get an audience with him, but I'm going to meet him. Because it's been out there resonating, vibrating, it's there. And I don't know what's going to happen, because I got a list of things that I want to tell him. <laughs> Something will happen. That was 26 years vibrating above me, hovering, waiting, you know. Some things just have to wait. Some things are not ready to bud the way you want them to. Some things take longer than others. This took 26 years for me to get an audience with Jay Abraham, but it's going to happen. So one thing that I'd like to do is I'd like um, you to ask me some questions. I'd like you to tell me what's frustrating you with your networking, what concerns you with your networking, because um, I think that you have an opportunity, we all have an opportunity, to learn from each other. And I just would like to know if any of you have any questions that you want to ask me, something you want to say about it, something that resonated with you. If you could just speak a little bit louder so everybody can hear. 
I'm interested in uh, social networking like tweeting and uh, Facebook and, and I keep getting these uh, emails to say you ought to use this as a tool and I I really don't know. I mean, what, what's your feeling about it? I don't really know. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I can tell you. Every once in a while, I feel like I am behind the power curve. But I can tell you something else. The world is based on relationships. And although all of that exists for all of us, it's a tool. It's a, it's a channel. It's all those things. But I don't think it's ever going to take the place of you and I having coffee and having a conversation and being able to talk to one another. Um, I would just, you know, this is my own opinion and I'm sure that there are lots of people that don't agree with this, but um, I would focus on yourself and what you need to accomplish. Focus on your goal. Focus on getting your needs met. And don't worry about what you're overlooking or what somebody's tweeting about or, you know, I, we just had this conversation. It's very distracting. It's very, very distracting. You know, I, I find myself to be, I, I guess, a technological idiot uh, because, you know, my kids I know. speak computer. I know. You know, I don't tweet. Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe people spend all that time on Facebook. I know. Like, they have nothing else to do with their lives. I know. I, I'm busy. I know. You know, but... Does you know, that, who feels that way? You're busy? You got time for this? I think, um, I, I saw Brooke tweet. smile, and, uh, and it, it's true. I think that when you grow up with it, I think it feels um, very different than when you don't. <clears throat> I think there is a good crossover, though, when it comes to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't really tweet, personally, but I do post things to LinkedIn that then automatically tweet to a Twitter account that I set up. Tweet to a Twitter for account. For my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought language. nobody, there was no way anybody was following me. People are following you. I go to I go to conferences and colleagues in India mm -hmm. are telling me how much they enjoyed reading something that I posted to LinkedIn like months before. I I don't I don't know how to make them come, but if you just post something once in a while that you think is interesting, mm -hmm. you will be surprised that people that are linked to you on there will take. I I read things that mm -hmm. probably ninety percent of what I read is has been posted by other people in my right. network. You know, and I just then like you to make you have something to talk to them about. Right. I, I just want to make one comment about it because I do feel strongly about this, um, and it's only because of my own experience that if you, if if you have people in your LinkedIn that you don't know, and you're accepting everybody, what you're doing is you're diluting your opportunities. Your LinkedIn, in my personal opinion, should be should be only people that you know. You, it, 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 it dilutes the opportunities. I, I can't tell you how many people, every once in a while, I'll go on somebody's LinkedIn, and I'll see, oh, that's a really interesting person. I really want to meet that person. And I'll reach out to the person I know, and they don't know them. And it's really, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a way into that, but I would personally rather have you have, it, have your LinkedIn network mirror your 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 personal network. Well, I have a question then. Let's say I'm looking for a very specific person because right now I'm looking for someone who deals with licensing. Okay. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. That's what I need. But I don't want to go out there and just right. throw it out there because who are these people? Right. I don't know them from, so how do I get to the people that will be trustworthy, that I can Can I introduce trust? you to my friend Bruce? <laughs> um, seriously. There you go. You, it is, it's why the security guy called me because he recognizes that my influence is very strong and that if I don't know the person, I know the next person that does. That's why this honeycomb that I handed you is so important because it's really in the second and third tier of your relationships that the power is. It's who knows them that's important. It's that you know to ask the right person because you can't know everybody. But it's through that influence that those dots get connected in a very strong way. Very important. Um, so maybe a bad metaphor, yeah. but if you think about you know, the phrase Ellen used about social capital, right. uh, you, know, you could either have a pocket full of pennies or a pocket full of dollars. Mm -hmm. And if all the people in your LinkedIn are just people who are people who ask to connect with you, they're a bunch of pennies. Or you could have a lot of dollars and those can be leveraged a lot better. Mm -hmm. right. 
um, and you want to be able to say, you know, I don't know the person, but you know, call Ellen or call Patrick, or you're going to get greater value. Quality. Than, it's quality. It's quality, it's quality in the. Yeah, it's quality in the. May I interject? I mean, I, this, conceptually, this sounds great, but it, in real world practice, if I have 400 people, if I have 200 people, and I know 200 better than I know the 400, but if I'm still sending out tweets and stuff, what difference does it make? Well, why, not, why not use all of them? You know what? It, I don't think that there's a right or wrong. I just think that there are preferences. Um, there are lots of people that just create large databases because they want to be in, they want to communicate with these large databases. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying for my own personal needs, I think less is more. I, you know, I think this meeting is a great meeting. I think that having a small group of people that you can actually connect with is better than going to a room for 80 or 100 people hoping that you're going to meet somebody. I just don't find that effective, in particular because time is what it is. We don't have all the time in the world. We're limited in our resources. Why not make those resources very productive? The way to do that is to bring people closer to you, not gather more and more and more. Because you don't know those other people. You can't trust them. You can't refer them. You're not going to do anything with them. If I don't know you, how can I refer you? How can I do that? I, I just think according to your point, yeah, 400 is better than 200. Right. But it's, is it 400 that you gather quickly or 400 that have been developed on a solid 200? Right. So, so, you know, it's a matter of understanding that it what, what I'm does trying take to, time and it's cumulative. What I'm trying to parse is that, is that what, in, in effect, in, in the real world, what difference does it make? I get your point. I think face-to-face -face meetings are the most effective way to really interact with people and be productive. But I'm just saying on something like LinkedIn, does it make any difference whether you've got two or four hundred if you're communicating with all of them anyway? I, I mean, that's my question. Uh, I, I, yes. I, I, I think it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think it depends on what you're doing. Are yes. you saying, hey, check out this article that I wrote or that I find interesting on this design? Or are you saying, hey, anybody know a good accountant? The latter, unless you know them all well, is, is not going to really serve you super well. The, the former is going to be great because someone might say, hey, you know, I really find him interesting. I'm going to continue to follow that, and maybe they'll be motivated to reach out to you directly and say, we should get coffee. That That's, I think, the ideal. Does that happen a lot? Right. You know, I said before, we don't have time for costly mistakes. We don't want to hire the wrong person. But what, it's interesting, though, because what I, what I, the aspect of networking that I like the least mm -hmm. is turning someone down, being asked to help and I can't mm. and I don't want to be that guy either yeah. and so it holds me back from asking for help mm. and hearing crickets mm. in return and it's happened right. and it's uncomfortable so I think that the thing that I'm hearing in your talk that I find interesting is that you have to start by being interested in them mm. then you build your karma bank that when you finally do ask for something mm -hmm they might feel that it's their turn to give back, and then it's less likely to be crickets. You know what, there's another point. You might ask me and I might not be able to help you. Um, I don't want to ask in an inappropriate way. I don't want to be one of those people that comes up and says, why can't you help me? I mean, people do that. Right. You know, asking is, is another muscle. You know, asking appropriately is even, a, it's a stronger muscle, because you have to know that you can. So let's just go, into Bruce's LinkedIn and let's see that he knows somebody that you want to reach. You know, if you develop a poor relationship with Bruce and you say, I, I noticed that John is in your LinkedIn, you know, I've been really dying to meet him, you probably will get an assistant. Somebody will take, Bruce in, in particular, will say, you know what, let me set up a meeting. You know, I, there's one person on Long Island who uh, does business development um, strictly for title company, the most boring thing in the world that you could think of. But this woman is nothing but a connector. All she does is, is meet people and find out who they want to meet, and she connects them. 
Do you know how much social capital she has in her database? It's huge. It's huge. She's just taking the time to make the connection and then see where the opportunity is to ask appropriately and then ask. But ask appropriately. Listen, the biggest skill that you can develop is your listening skill. The biggest skill that you can develop is a list of questions that you can ask other people. Um, you know, pick five that, that have to do with them. How did you get in that business? How, why are you interested in that? What, you know, what are you looking to accomplish? You know, all you have to do is have three or four questions and you can be the Jay Abraham of yeah. That, that's that's what I find so so uncomfortable when it's done improperly is that yes. is that I can be I can receive a LinkedIn request to connect mm -hmm. and I swear thirty five seconds later I'm I'm getting the request like you're already asking me to help you you barely know me yeah mm -hmm. and it's like and then I don't want to be that guy either and mm -hmm. so what you're saying is you have to sort of first start by building a bit of capital. Hey, is there anything I can do? I noticed that to connect. The, yes. Something, you gotta offer, it, it comes by giving first. Right, so you shouldn't be worried about what other people are doing inappropriately. What you need to do is build a wall around yourself, not a closed one, but a wall around yourself and what you need to do. And don't worry <laughs> when you meet someone that's inappropriate. They will be inappropriate because most of the people don't understand what they're doing. And the thing that's necessary for you is you need to know what you're doing. You need to know where to go. You need to know what you're looking for. You need to be prepared. Forget the rest. I get people gossiping about other people. I get them complaining about other people. Why doesn't he give me anything? I gave him. He's not giving me. It's a bunch of, it's just uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, just focus on yourself. Look, in, look at your own database uh, in the next week or so, if you have the time. Look in your database, figure out who is there that you are interested in developing a better relationship with and make that happen. Those people are gonna be grateful that you're taking initiative to say, let's get together and see how we can help each other. You might not be able to help that person, but you're taking an interest in doing so. And by doing that, you're exercising the muscle. And who knows what's going to come from it? You just don't know. A question. Um, I do, we do mostly personal training. So the clients, I feel that the clients are there to work out. They're there for their privacy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to cross the line. Right. So what's the rule book for that? I mean, do I want to, if, if I wanted to network with somebody just hypothetically, mm -hmm. it feels like I'm breaking into their personal space. OK. I can answer this because I have a client just like you. Um, and uh, he actually has taken an interest in his clients in their business lives and he's introduced them to his network that he networks with and he's done nothing but open up their eyes to opportunity. They will be grateful when you say to them, you know, could you tell me more about your business? How, you know, is there something that, you know, you're looking to accomplish with your business? I know it's not what we, you know, why you come here. But I am interested in knowing what you do. Who do you want to meet? Just take an interest in other people, and your world will open up. Don't be shy about doing it, because people, most people are meeting shy people. They're, they're, they're meeting the people that just want to come and ask. They don't want to take any time. You'll be very distinctive when you do this. Very, very distinctive. Yes? Question. So what if Reliable Source offers somebody to you that you, you know you, you don't know that you really want to go in that direction you're not ready for it whatever it is mm -hmm. does it make sense then to still reach out to them just to say hello you know what I I believe so you know why because I think that we're relying on other people's judgment and instinct when you when you decided the last three weeks that somebody should meet somebody it's because you heard something and you got an instinct I'm telling you that you should follow through on that. Even if it's, Mary thought that we should talk, spend a few minutes, what are you doing now, how are you doing it, gee, you know, you know, maybe we could get together in the future. There's just a courteous, you know, Mary thought we should talk, really nice, you know, just be interested in other people. It's going to work for you. 
Be honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. What organizational skills do you use to keep track of your network? And, and do you have a little sheet sheets on what their uh, expertise is or what, what sparks them? You know, uh, it's interesting. Um, I should. I'm getting older and I don't really remember all that much anymore. <laughs> uh, um, you know, once you start to listen, um, and I'm not saying that I remember every detail, but once you take an interest in a person and, you're, and your ears are open and you're truly listening, because you know when somebody's not, um, you remember these things. I, I mean, you could use a three by five card if you don't really want to go on the computer. You can use the computer. Um, I love the, I have an iPhone and I love the voice thing now that you can record because I can leave a meeting and I can make myself a note. Say I just met with Bruce and I could, you know, make a, a short list of things that I want to remember or use a notebook. You know, I find um, that today um, I like to have a notebook. I mean, talk about being in another world with the computers. I know that there are people that are just totally, you know, they're paperless. But I find myself still with a notebook. I like my family. Something I do that, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Notebook is great. Mm -hmm. But I found that when I meet with people and you know, taking out an electronic device puts some people off. Yes. But on the other hand, if you say, you know, I apologize for taking out my iPhone, but I find that if I just send an email right away because yeah. I felt that you should meet or, or right. they appreciate that right? because you know, so much of what you hear with networking is people making all these phony promises or I'm going to connect you to someone and nothing ever happens. Right, right, right. And but it doesn't happen. you act on it immediately. Yeah. It doesn't happen important. for a few reasons too and that has to do with the complexity of our lives. How many people have an iPhone? So um, there's an app that's called Card Munch. I don't know if anybody knows it. Card Munch. 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 Card Munch. Um, if you don't have it, I like it. It's owned by LinkedIn. It allows you to take a picture of somebody's business card and have it populate, um, not almost instant, almost instantaneously. And it will allow you to either email that person, forward that person, share the contact. Um, I happen to like it. It's, it, it makes things easier card to do. Munch. Card munch. Um, any other questions? I brought you um, an article that I've had around for a while um, because um, this concept of network science is very powerful these days. There are lots of people in universities studying how networks operate. Um, when I started, I basically begged people to network. Um, networking has been around since the beginning of time, but not in a formalized way. And I find that in today's world, there are lots of people um, well, let me step back. When I started, I begged people. And um, my, as I said, my oldest group is 26 years old, and a lot of those people in that group have been with me that long. Um, what I found over the years is that the pendulum is swinging. And while the, those formalized networks began to blossom in the early 90s, and uh, organizations like BNI and LATIP showed up, some of you might know those organizations, they are national networks um, that have local chapters. Um, and of course, ABA is just regional, we're in uh, Northern Jersey and New York City and Long Island. But what I noticed is that now there's so much networking going on that they have become business card exchanges and not formalized places where you can actually develop rapport and relationship like you can with an organization like this. I encourage you to do more of this and less of the very large, you know, groups because it's difficult, in particular if you are not that comfortable, for you to go up to somebody and all of a sudden just start a conversation. Again, I take an introduction any day of the week than going to a large event where I don't know anybody. It's just too impersonal, you know. And if you belong to a large organization, you certainly should belong on committees because that's where you'll be able to relate to other people. If you're not, then again, you can pay your membership dues and you can show up and you can have a few drinks and you can do all that, but it's not as effective as creating a small group around you of like-minded people who are curious. Because that's all this is about. It's about curiosity 
and being open to the possibilities of the serendipity coming when you least expect it. And that's the way that goes. Um, this is, uh, uh, the title of this is How Network Science Can Speed Up Your Success by 10 or 20 Times. Those of you who are uh, engineer types and science types will like this because it's really all about um, the exponential opportunities that happen with leverage. And leverage really is about doing things jointly. Uh, I think you, you said something about it. If you look for people around you that you can collaborate with, you will find life becomes fun. Because it's difficult to be isolated in a world like this. Isolation, that's why people join my organization. You know, it, it's community. You need to be in community. And whether or not that's whatever field you're in, in a professional trade association, or it's some other, or, this organization is perfect for you. It's perfect because each of you has a goal and a dream that is somehow related um, to everybody else's goal and dream. It's experience. If, if I may, you know, about networking, as no one's saying, it's not about transactions, it's about resources, it's about community. And I was a member of an organization about seven years ago. <coughs> and when my company was starting to do a lot of work with uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, and we needed to improve our banking relationship. And one of the co-chairs of the association I was part of was a banker. And it was a local bank. And he wasn't able to help us with our um, international transactions. And I was just lamenting to John one day. And he said, you know, what, what would make your life simpler? He said, I'd love to have overnight clearance of checks that I get from an account like Bed Bath & Beyond. It's big money. He says, well, I'll write you a note, and you just show it to your branch manager. Like really? Like, I've known you for two years. You know, I don't mind doing that for you. And more than any sale or transaction I had in my business at that time, or two years before, or two years after, yeah. having John just simply say, "I'll give you a letter mm -hmm. to take to the branch," and I got overnight clearance of, or instant clearance of checks. Not even overnight clearance; it was instant clearance of yeah. checks. Yeah, be careful what you ask for; you might get it. <laughs> so it's about building a group of people who you just feel like they're a part of, you say, a professional network, mm -hmm. like-minded individuals, other inventors. Uh, you never know how it's going to pay off. I guess she'll even tell that story to this day right. because it was so unexpected. Absolutely. Any other questions? Anybody else? Something that you are afraid to ask? You would, um, I guess, Gordon, you were asking about uh, you know, social network or yeah. social media. Right. And just actually driving here today with my daughter and her friend, we were talking about it. And two concepts that I think might be interesting, Bill sort of alluded to it, um, about creating concentric circles of where your most private network is and where your more general network is. And so they were talking about where one of them actually uses Instagram for broadcasting to the largest group and keeps Facebook very private. The other uses Facebook as the broadest and uses Instagram for the most private. So there are ways to layer. You might use LinkedIn for a more broad public persona, but keep Facebook very private. Or you may use Gordon Perry as a person on LinkedIn one way, yeah, Gordon Randall Perry design on LinkedIn in another way. So you can have two Yes. I do have a question. Yes. And it's a, a funny question. It, 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 I've been reluctant to ask it because we were talking before about appropriate questions to ask. Mm -hmm. My sales guru says, uh, go up to someone you know, on, maybe on the phone, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to ask for a referral mm -hmm. because people love to refer. And to me, that's one of the most awkward, I'd, I'd rather just shrink into the ground. I mean, I, it's just very difficult. So what's inappropriate? How do you do that? Well, first of all, you were told at a very early age to sit down and be quiet and don't ask any questions. So that's number one, and then we have to overcome and that. You know my mother? <laughs> that's just the way it is. Unless we're of the, you know, new generation where they ask anything and it doesn't really matter. Um, we're really reluctant to do that. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want people to say no to us. But again, appropriate asking. It's, um, I, I don't really, um, 
So I'm sure that lots of people have written some books about asking. But asking is a very subtle um, activity. It, it's, it's not, you know, can you give me a referral? It's, I'm looking to meet a particular type of person. Do you know anybody, or do you know anybody that knows anybody? Because again, the second and third uh, tier of relationship is really, people would be much more comfortable recommending somebody who might know somebody than recommending, than doing that themselves. Yes? <clears throat> Another thing to think about is, I have an opportunity for somebody who does X. Yeah. And somebody wants to hook somebody else up, mm -hmm. like because they'll see it potentially come back to them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Reciprocity doesn't need to be direct at all. Right. It can be I was a resource to this other person. They're going to think of me next time, right. and you're you are helping that middle person, mm -hmm. and also helping you know maybe it's yourself, maybe it's someone else. So, so I always say reciprocity. You know, I'll always be reciprocal, but I can't guarantee it's going to be symmetrical. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, that that um, that reciprocity is important. But the position also that you spoke about, I think, is important. Jay Abraham, getting back to Jay because I quote him, it's like I can't even believe it. But he has a concept called the strategy of preeminence, and basically what that is about is about making sure that you're serving or that you're providing the highest and best opportunity that you can. So taking the, your position that is, I have an opportunity for somebody, and I'm looking for somebody X, is really taking the responsibility to the next level that says, um, there may be some business. So you don't have to put the focus on you, I need this. You can use words to your advantage that will minimize that, that resistance that you are feeling because that's it's just resistance listen belief up here what it is we think and we feel is between this year and this year and it's based on what we have learned before that is not necessarily true and when I say networking is a muscle and what you are capable of doing um, with that muscle has all sorts of ramifications you're never going to be inappropriate, I can tell that. You're not going to be one of those people that other people want to back away from. But you are a person that has influence and has something of value that you can speak of um, that might be useful to other people. So there are ways around it. There are opportunities for you to use words in ways that you really haven't thought about. But I can tell you, nobody likes to ask because we don't want to be rejected. Um, and that is a very, very big deal. People don't want to look weak either. Exactly. If asking, oh, if so I ask, somebody might think that I, listen, this is a story. Thank you. I just cut you off. Um, so on Long Island, we have the Long Island Association. It's like a big political action. You know, everybody needs to belong to the LIA. And one day, I had a man come from the board of that organization into my organization and I thought to myself he's on the board he came to me and he said to me you know and I get no business I'm not getting any business I'm like I'm up there with all those guys but it's not happening and I thought to myself well it's not happening for a few reasons one of which he does not want to appear weak he doesn't want to appear in the minds of all those other people who he thinks are successful or more successful than him um, that they might think that he's not doing too well. It became a problem for him. But it was really between here and here that the problem existed because he had every opportunity to be with those people and to network at a level that would give him what he needs. It just it didn't happen because he did not see himself there. So belief is a big deal here. How you see yourself and how, how, how much conviction you have about what it is you're looking to accomplish is really at the core of whether or not you're going to step out and look out way beyond um, where you have been looking. Yes. So, so as it pertains to inventors particularly, we tend to be a bit of a private bunch. Yes. And I think for two reasons. First is we don't want to accidentally disclose our intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Make a 
But but second is that the minute you go on any sort of uh, networking other than this club here, but never asking for help, you inevitably attract the wrong kind of attention. So so how how what, what do, would you have to suggest to, to the group as to how do you how do you make sure that you? you know, I've heard a couple of people say that you, you don't want to attract the unscrupulous ones who will be the ones who will promise you the moon and then in fact not really charge you a certain amount of money and then, and then you're still stuck with your. Idea. You know, I think that's why the security guy called me because. I'm a go-to person. I'm not going to give him access to anybody that I haven't vetted out and that I don't think he needs to talk to. And so what I can say to you, first of all, listen, if you have an idea, you are going to have to speak to somebody. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. So that's number one. You, you can't come from your idea from scarcity. You have to come from abundance, and you have to come requesting of other people that you know and trust access to what you're looking for. Because somebody will have what you're looking for. I think a couple of other perspectives. Um, it's trust your instincts. You talked about instincts, so trust your instincts. You have that weird feeling in your stomach. Yeah. Run the other way. Right, exactly. But it's also, you, know, you were asking about licensing people. Mm -hmm. And what I was going to suggest to you is, you don't want to look for one. You want to get three, four, five names. It takes time to develop an understanding or a knowledge base. And you have to put the work in. So don't be afraid to ask more than one people, person if they know someone. Yeah. And then when you start doing it, trust your instincts. Reveal a little at a time, mm -hmm. but don't reveal it all. There are things that Lewis will tell you about confidentiality agreements. Right. But um, you have to open up a little. But a lot of inventors are, we talk about this a lot, inventor, paranoid yeah. beyond belief. Right, 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 right. But I think being in an environment like this um, would allow you um, to be able to share all of these, let's just call them concerns. Um, and, you know, perhaps somebody else in the room has already gone through what you're looking to accomplish. These are, again, you're all a resource for each other. You're at different stages. You have different levels of experience. But you can't not be in community. You can't not be in conversation. And to your point, you want to be in a place where you feel it's okay. Because I, I respect what you're saying. You don't want to reveal too much to people that you don't know. But again, that's why you get to other people. Yes? If I may say, um, to answer some of your concerns, as an inventor, it, 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 it may and it's not very hard. It may seem like a monumental task to put together a provisional patent application, but that is the best possible protection you could have. At least you have something filed and you have something to show. Yeah, you know, even if you take photographs um, and, and just write out a, a, a description of it, put it together and give it to an attorney to file it for you, he'll look over it, he'll charge you a few hundred dollars. But no, no, I'm, you're totally, I'm totally aware of that, uh, but I meant other, other aspects. So suppose suppose I'm, I'm, I'm doing well in my project with the IP side, suppose the, the prototyping side, I'm, I'm all right. Suppose I'm stuck at the packaging phase, but then there's other, you know, like, uh, if I go ahead and I reveal that, I feel I'm revealing something intimate about my the stage at which I'm in my. In it my depends project. on who you're revealing it to, though. That's yeah. true, I guess. Yeah, that's and, true. And again, I mean, they can't, you know. Uh, I got yes, this, you this would text have to Carlos go. the other day. Uh, but I think your point, you know, and that the provisional patent is one tool, and it may be appropriate for some people and not for others. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at whatever stage you're right. at, in your, you know. But I think that's a, a great lesson because it's also a lot of inventors sometimes feel they want to get there without spending any money. But sometimes it does right. take investment. And otherwise, and I joke about it, otherwise you feel like you're just holding a winning lottery ticket waiting for somebody to pick your number. Right, right, right. And, and, and as far as this uh, confidentiality agreement, I, I signed one and I went to a uh, supplier out in Syos Long Island and it, it, it really meant nothing. 
talking about depends that. on the people because yeah talk about scrupulous you talk about you hear people you know talking about how they got screwed over this way and that way and a lot of us have mm -hmm. and a lot of people have you know so yeah. but I just think that you know protecting yourself as an inventor um, you don't have the money to lay out and a lot of us don't we have to do it ourselves. Right. No risk, no reward, though. That's what yeah, comes to my mind. Is. I mean, you can, I, I know that it's uncomfortable when, you, when you're stepping out and you're, but if you are stepping out with the right people, um, you know, you, you, should, you, you can minimize some of that risk. Hi. Um, well, I think that in minimizing the risk, I think as inventors, it's really behooves all of us to become very familiar with what the law provides for. And since the patent laws have changed in recent, it's really more critical than ever to really get yourself on the PTO site and really understand where your rights lie and so that as you engage in conversation with people you trust, because I completely agree with Bruce, you know, you, if it's not passing the sniff test, just yeah. get oh, out. Yeah. Use your okay. Once you've determined that these people are indeed trustworthy, nonetheless, reveal according to what's going to protect your rights in any conversation because you still never know. Well, the old expression that Reagan used with the Russians, trust but verify. <laughs> well, yes. Louis, did you have a question or a comment? I think your perspective on that is great. I guess for the inventor community, it's interesting because I notice from where I, the vantage I sit at, everyone's like, well, we have to find somebody inexpensive. We don't have a lot of money to spend. And I get that. At the same time, there's a whole strata, unfortunately, that prey on inventors because they know that's exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And when I introduce myself at every one of these meetings, I say, I understand. I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm getting a Yankee salary for what I do, <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean I don't have a bunch of people that I know that are trustworthy, that are that are going to be ethical, that I work with and are now on their own that can help you at that level. So sometimes you have to shoot high and then you can find what you're looking for at a different strata because shooting high, you're gonna be able to get the comfort level you're gonna get. I have no need, no desire. I, have, I represent too many people to be playing around to steal somebody's invention. That's a great perspective. I see it sometimes too. The marquee value of you working in a firm like this is to some degree, a bit of an insulation for an inventor because you have a reputation to protect. The mark, you shouldn't be afraid of somebody who has a high billing rate. They certainly, if they're a trusted advisor to their clients, they're gonna to wanna to be a trusted advisor to everyone, and they'll figure out a way to create a referral. And that's part of you know looking for, whether it be a licensing guy or somebody else. Um, don't be afraid or intimidated by expensiveness. It's always okay to say, it's too much for me, but they may come up with a solution. Anybody else have a question that you didn't want to ask? Yeah. Do you recommend uh, anyone you speak to if you don't have IP, protect, IP protection to sign a non-circumvent or a non-disclosure agreement? I think it's it depends uh, it de what you're trying to protect, uh, what stage of the conversation you're at. Uh, there are ways to start to get a sense of the person, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say there's no reason not to but it could just be premature in the conversation. It may be, somebody may not be ready to sign your confidentiality agreement. Not because they're not willing to be confidential with you, they don't know what you're asking them to be confidential it's about. They have. Right. Yeah. So, take your time, I, I think is the point. They're tough. Right. Not, not <laughs> not as as tough. Okay. I mean, you know, when you're in the trenches and on the road, you very rarely see a solo inventor being able to say, yeah, I had a non-disclosure, and Hasbro stole my toy, and I'm going to take them to court for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because it takes, there's not a lot of money coming back. You have to remember the enforcement end of it is expensive. I think, so I'm sorry, go ahead. It's sort of putting locks on your door. If someone's going to rob you, they're going to rob you whether or not you have the best lock on your door or not. Right. Okay, but having a lock on the door and, and it's just sort of keeps honest people honest. So if someone's willing to sign a non disclosure and talk to you, they're generally going to be honest or not honest. You, they should be in place so everybody so it's like the lock on the door but I find it's another litmus test also depending upon how they might react to you asking right. them to right. sign it right. you can get another piece of that puzzle in terms of that butterfly feeling in your stomach if you're saying gee that just 
they didn't react well to that, or they run away, or <laughs> figure out another path. Can I second that? In fact, there is not a conversation I have without an NDA in place. Mm -hmm. And if they're not willing to do it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Next. But to Lewis's point too, which is interesting, you know, somebody once gave this description. No matter how much paper you have, no matter how it's solid that NDA is, right. if they're gonna screw you, they're gonna screw you. It'll only help you eventually get recourse possibly, but it's not gonna stop them from doing the bad stuff to you. So Well, I was at the uh, toy fair two years ago and I met Robert Crook, the guy who did the silly bands. Mm -hmm. And I showed him something, he goes, You're gonna be on Easy Street in six months, I love your idea. It took me a month to get an NDA from him, mm -hmm. never got him on the phone again. That was that was the end of that. So, there. Yeah. Well, Patrick talks about this a lot. Is you know, watch out for people who are cheerleaders. You know, you have to understand what their motivation to being a cheerleader to you is. Uh, there's a difference between being a trusted advisor and someone to encourage and empower you. But if they just cheerlead, there might be another motivation. Right. I just want to speak to your comment that you know you're typically um, you know very closed, and um, I I think that. That that's true because you have an idea that that um, that that you want uh, to see come to some type of fruition, and um, I just want to some type of fruition. We want to make a million dollars. We want to make a million dollars. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to get very specific. Do you want some type of fruition? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You want to make a million dollars? I don't want to be that boy. That's fruition. But in order to make that happen. I, I mentioned scarcity and abundance before. Right. You have to have an abundant mentality. Um, you, you have to be cautious, there's no question. You have to have the right counsel, you have to have the right guidance, right. but you have to have an abundant mentality. <clears throat> because if you don't... What does that mean? It means that you have to be open. You have to see it. You have to believe it. You have to act as if it's already done. And you have to not um, think that everything that's in front of you is going to be the next obstacle. That's what I mean. I think that you have to act as if you're already there and be open to the possibility that what you need is going to show up right. because it's resonant. A more positive thinking. A more positive thought process. You must, you must, you must. Lewis because is abundant. He comes at it from abundance. He's not concerned that every client that walks in the door has to be his. Right. He's not afraid to share it with right. someone else. Right. Right. It's, um, it's, a bit, it's a big piece of you getting your dreams to reality. <clears throat> because without it, everything seems like, nah, not bad today. I met this guy, nah, that's not going to work. Nah, that's not going to work. And there's a lot of opportunity that you have that you actually put that resistance in front of you that's a result of you being fearful that something might actually happen. That you, that, that, that um, you know, uh, zoom to the stars might actually become a reality. If you are fearful that, oh my God, that might happen, then you may continue to create these obstacles for yourselves that don't really belong there. So please, abundance at all costs, abundance. Because you have all of these people that are around you that have um, access to resources and opportunities for you that can help you. You know, it's just, there. It, all this is is a process that you're going through. It's about steps and people and assets and opportunity. And they're just steps. You may get three quarters down the road and go, well, I don't know, this is not really what I thought it was gonna be. But I have news for you. You are entrepreneurial. Um, you have entrepreneurial spirit already. And this goes back a very long time. And I don't know who said it, but millionaires, billionaires have been in 17 different businesses. They've created 17 different products. They have the spirit of looking for something and bringing something from an idea into the into the ether, into the into the the what reality. are we talking about? <laughs> the real world. Making rich. Making grow rich. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm just saying. You know, if the, if it's not this idea that you have, it's going to be a next one because you can't help it. You are. You wouldn't be here tonight if you did not have that spark inside of you. But so, you, but you don't want you don't want them stealing. You know, even your first baby. Okay, mm -hmm. you don't. You know, but yeah, I see a problem, and in a couple of days, 
I've come up with a solution. Right. And that's right. That's what your job is. That's what your job is. That's what you know. We look at these obstacles as things that are problems. But that's what your job is. They come up and you have to solve them. They come up and you solve them. That's what your job is, yes. Uh, all I was gonna say is, you could have the best patent in the world. If you don't make the product or bring it to market well, it doesn't matter. So, you know, there, there's a lot to focus on. I know we're talking about IP and the conversations with people and networking, but, um, you know, I just think as long as you don't tell them how, you can you can hint at what mm -hmm. and, and have the, the networking problem. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, maybe, you know, there are certain, you know, Coke doesn't want to give us their recipe, but um, I, I think that there are certain things that even if somebody got your idea, they're not, they, they're not going to do it. You know, they don't have your, your passion. They don't have your dream. They don't have your desire. I mean, Listen, I'm sure, I don't live in your world, I'm sure that lots of things get stolen by other people, but. I just think that, I mean, that's different from engaging somebody to potentially make your product, mm -hmm. where I just bring it back to networking. Right. It's like, this is what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. People can't do much with that. Right. Right, you don't have to tell them everything. Yeah, right. thanks right. for bringing that up. That's a very, very good point. Any other questions? Bruce? Thank you. thank you. But thank you, Ellen. I hope this was useful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For some more questions, we'll take a, a, a bio break for everyone, and uh, please feel free to mingle and enjoy some of the beverages. Network. Network. Yes, I do. Do you have a